I'd like to introduce your host for today's conference, Sarah Bernal. Thank you. You may begin. Thank you very much. And on behalf of the National Cancer Institute, I wish to welcome everyone to the January Advanced Topics of Implementation Science webinar. Today we are so very delighted to welcome our presenters, Dr. Rachel Tabak from Washington University at St. Louis and Dr. Ted Scolaris with the University of Michigan. They will be joined by our own Dr. David Chambers, who will be moderating the session. A very brief word about logistics and we'll be off. As the operator said, questions are encouraged, and there are two ways you can ask your question. You can press star 1 and ask your question on the phone live. You'll be placed in the queue to do that. Or you can also type your question at the Q&A tab of the top of your screen and hit ask to submit the question. You can submit the question at any time, but we'll be opening the session for questions when all the speakers have finished. Without any further ado, it is my pleasure to turn the meeting over to Dr. David Chambers. Thanks, Sarah. Um, and uh, just wanted to very briefly uh, welcome you all. Uh, outside of our offices, it's very snowy. Hopefully, where you are, it is warm, uh, maybe sunny. Uh, but uh, we are so grateful to have uh, you here, and particularly grateful to have both uh, Rachel and Ted uh, engaging us in a discussion that, that really cuts to our efforts to advance implementation science. As many of you know, there have been a development of any number of frameworks of models of theories around dissemination and implementation. And often it may be hard for us as researchers to navigate what's the most appropriate model or framework to start with. And how do I get a sense of uh, how they sort of stack up? Uh, just uh, a lot of, some of this work started when uh, several of us, Ross Brownson and, and I at, at, a, at the same meeting, were asked to present uh, two different talks in which we were asked to think about relevant conceptual frameworks. And we realized at this meeting that even though both of us were quite familiar with a lot of the frameworks, when it came to our different slides and what we had chosen, there wasn't a tremendous amount of overlap. And it just underscored the need to try and figure out a more systematic way uh, to uh, provide more guidance around conceptual frameworks, around models, around theories. Uh, Rachel, uh, and, uh, along with Elaine um, uh, Kuhn from uh, Washington University at St. Louis, did a wonderful job of doing a systematic, a pretty systematic analysis of those frameworks that were out there and really led the charge to try and present uh, this kind of uh, guidance to the field, uh, which was published a, a couple of years ago in the American Journal of Preventive Medicine, and of course she's going to talk about that. Um, Ted Scolaris took some of that work and uh, extended it in a poster that some of you may have seen at the, eight, at the seventh annual Dissemination Implementation Research Conference, uh, and we're just so grateful to have them kicking off uh, the discussion, and grateful to all of you for hopefully uh, your contributions, uh, your questions, and ways in which we can work together to move uh, the use uh, of models and, and, and discussion of them in, in DNI going forward. Uh, so with that, I'd uh, love to turn it over to, uh, to Rachel. Uh, and uh, thanks very much. Okay. Uh, thanks, David, and uh, everyone for joining us. Um, so I'm going to talk through um, our paper looking at um, reviewing the theories and frameworks used in DNI research. Uh, what I'll do is talk very briefly uh, about the importance of frameworks and theories in DNI research. Uh, just like we did in the paper, um, I'll refer to theories and frameworks using just the term models, even though they can be different things conceptually, um, I'll give them uh, that same name. Um, I'll talk about the paper methodology and our results, um, and I'll talk through our inventory and the categorization of the models and how that can uh, be useful in informing the selection of a model for, for your study. Um, and I'll provide a few resources uh, for selecting the model uh, and then also for using a model. So I think probably people are here uh, because they understand the benefits of using uh, models in research and are looking for ways to incorporate DNI models into their uh, studies. So I don't know that I need to give too much uh, emphasis on that, but I did want to say that um, models do enhance the effectiveness of intervention studies. Um, studies in public health that utilize models have uh, found better results. And there's research to demonstrate that in DNI, uh, use of models can also enhance the interpretability of a study uh, and ensure the, that essential implementation strategies are included there. So uh, we do encourage using these models um, in framing your study. And so we went to look at what models were available um, for researchers to use and kind of what was out there in the field. Uh, we started with a snowball sampling method. We took a listing um, that Ross and David had created of some of the most popular models 
uh, and then their authors in the field, and we use the references from these uh, as well as from some reviews to identify more and more uh, models from there. We also consulted experts uh, in the field to get other lists from them and make sure that we had a pretty good uh, comprehensive list of models, uh, though not an exhaustive list. Um, and we looked at those papers, reports, and also presentations um, as our sources. Uh, once we had that initial pool, we applied some specific criteria to narrow that search down to specifically focus on models for DNI research. Uh, so we excluded models that focus only on individual behavior change. Uh, those have been reviewed elsewhere and sort of were outside our scope. Um, we also really wanted the focus to be on research. So we excluded models that uh, focused only on guiding implementation efforts by practitioners and clinicians. Uh, these are useful uh, but not necessarily applicable to DNI research. And so there have been other reviews that have looked at those, um, especially in particular fields, but we didn't feel those were applicable to DNI research. Uh, we also uh, excluded models that focus only on disseminating findings at the end of a grant. Uh, we wanted models that could be used comprehensively throughout a research study. We were looking also at local level DNI, so things that focus at organizational or community levels. Uh, if they were national dissemination plans, we actually excluded those as well. Um, and for our own uh, experience, we included only uh, English publications. Um, once we were doing this review process, a few different categories emerged, and I'll discuss what those are um, as, as I move through the talk. Um, the last step in our review was contacting the study authors. We actually looked uh, to the model developers to make sure that we had appropriately named the model and also that we had the best references for those. And for some of the models, we actually um, cross-checked the categories we assigned the models uh, to, with those the authors of those models. And so... As I mentioned, some categories emerged as we were doing um, this process. Um, we look at these um, on a couple of different continua. So the first one related to construct flexibility, so how prescriptive the model was um, in its construct. There were a couple of extremes to this continuum. So at one end, there were broad models. Those were models that contained more, uh, more loosely outlined or defined constructs. These give uh, the researcher more flexibility in applying the model across the different a, a more broad array of, of context, um, but it does place more responsibility on the researcher when it comes to thinking about how to think through and operationalize and implement that model. At the other extreme were operational models. These are one that gave, ones that gave very detailed step-by-step -step actions for completion of the DNI process. They uh, made, made the process more concrete and more clearly defined, uh, but were then, because of that, more uh, particular to a specific context or activity. In between those two extremes, there were constructs that were more or less detailed than the broad models, um, that were, I'm sorry, more detailed than the broad models, but also uh, a little bit less prescriptive than the operational models. Um, so they offered a little bit less flexibility across contexts, but were a little more helpful in um, aiding the researcher in vis visualizing the role of that model in a study design. The next continuum that kind of emerged to us uh, was dissemination or implementation. So dissemination studies focus on um, an active approach to spreading evidence-based interventions, whereas implementation studies focus more on putting the evidence-based intervention in place. And there were models that focused more or less on, on one of those extremes, or some that actually uh, focused um, on both dissemination and Im implementation equally. Um, and the final way that we categorized the models was using um, the social ecological framework. So we looked at whether the models might apply to individual level, organizational level, community level, or system level as a way of um, seeing what how models might apply. So this is just another way to look um, at the different uh, categories, the different continuums. Um, I did also want to point out that we did note models that looked at policy, uh, policy dissemination, and uh, we noted that in this process, we had two reviewers um, categorize each model, and then we resolved our disagreements uh, in that process by discussing uh, what level we thought the model should be at. So here's what we found. Initially, we identified 109 models. Uh, we had to exclude some of these. 26 were focused on practitioners, so they were not focused on dissemination implementation research. Um, and then 12 were not local level dissemination, so either they were a national plan or they uh, were individual behavior change, and so we excluded those. There were eight that focused only on dissemination of information at the end of a grant, and so we excluded 
um, eight that way, and then two of them were duplicates, so we combined them. Um, which left us with 61 models at the end, um, and we took those 68 models and applied all of our categorizations to those models. And so you can see um, we had a couple of different ways described in the paper of how to organize the models to help um, researchers select from those 61 um, what model might be most appropriate for their study. So first, um, we or organized them um, in this table, which is table two in the paper, based on uh, their focus on dissemination or implementation and also their construct flexibility. Um, what can be really useful in this table is if you are looking for a specific um, social ecological level or looking for a policy that, a, 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 I'm sorry, a model that addressed policy, you could scroll down through the table and look for ones that might um, be in the appropriate places. Um, and also it groups them, by grouping them um, by dissemination level and concert flexibility, you can also scroll that way um, for a model that might be most applicable to your focus. Um, I did want to point out that there were at least four models in each of the five categories for dissemination and implementation and also for construct flexibility. So we did have a pretty good representation across the categories that we created. Um, this is just a summary. It's not um, in the paper, but it's uh, looking at the distribution of models based on the two categories, construct flexibility and dissemination implementation. Um, simultaneously, when we looked at how um, the models dispersed across these, and there were a couple of trends that we saw. Um, so models that tended to focus on implementation were more in the operational side of the construct flexibility uh, category. On the other hand, in general, um, models that were dissemination only through dissemination more than implementation had more variety and also just more models um, in those categories. Also, all the broad models were either in dissemination only or in dissemination equals implementation. Um, so that's where those kind of fell out. Um, so this is the third table in the paper. Um, it's sort of a categorization matrix that we think um, is particularly useful in helping to identify uh, which model might fit best um, for your study. So if you look across the top of the table, um, you can look for where your study falls in the continuum from dissemination to implementation. And once you've found sort of where that area is, you can look down the column for the level of construct flexibility that is most comfortable for you as a researcher. Um, I do want to point out, and I'll mention this I think again at the end, but these categories are uh, continua. They're not discrete buckets. And so um, when you're looking at the box you might identify as the most relevant, I would suggest also looking at the boxes kind of adjacent to that to make sure um, that you're getting all the models that might be most relevant to you. Um, and what this can do is give you a little bit more narrow down list of models, so you're not starting with all 61 and having to go and get detailed information on each one, but you can take the list you've narrowed um, and explore the details of each of those models a little bit more deeply to give you a sense of which of the models is going to be a best fit for your study. And so the first place that you can go to do that is actually the appendix table. Um, this is similar to the uh, table two in the paper in that it has um, the dissemination implementation category, the construct flexibility, and the social ecological framework categories, but it also has a couple of other uh, pieces of information that I think are useful um, once you sort of narrowed your search in picking um, a model. Um, one of them is the field of origin. So this describes the context in which the model was originally developed. If you're working in a particular context, context you might look for models um, from a similar field. Um, they might have particularly relevant constructs, or they might have some validity, validity in the context in which you are working in. Um, on the other hand, you might find a model from a different field um, and see that it might apply. This can um, give you a little bit more innovation in your study um, if you're applying a model to a new context. Um, and it can also prevent duplication of models across disciplines. So if there's a model that exists from a different field that might be relevant to your study, there's less of a need to develop a new one um, than, than taking one from a different field. We also looked at um, examples of where the studies were, where the models had been used in actual studies. Uh, you will notice that some of the, the boxes there are actually blank. Um, we couldn't find for some of the models an empirical use for testing of that model. Um, we were pretty uh, strict here. We only wanted to include uh, references here where the, the model was actually used in the study, not a place where it was just referenced. And so uh, there was definitely more. Uh, there were some models that hadn't actually had any publications at the time of our study that had been um, published empirically. Uh, we had one other measure that we thought was useful. Um, we looked at the number of times a model had been cited to get sort of a sense of the popularity of a model. 
Um, one caution on this, we didn't adjust in any way for the age of the models. So um, for models that are much older, um, like Diffusion of Innovations has almost 40,000 citations, um, those are going to have more just because they've been around a long time and also because they're popular. Um, we did check back on them a few years later, and some have increased at a higher rate um, compared to others. So it might be if you're looking for a particular, uh, particularly popular model that that might give you some um, criteria in, in choosing it, you can also put it in Google Scholar and, and see um, how its new number of references compares to what's here, and that can give you a sense of how much it's been, been being used in the field. Um, so, again, these are uh, just developed to sort of facilitate selection. We um, let these categories emerge as we were reviewing the papers. They're not really discrete buckets. They're really, again, more continua to help um, organize the models. Uh, we, we really just wanted them to be some way to break down the models so you weren't starting with all 61. Um, we did also want to note that there's considerable overlap between the models, and so in picking, um, you might look at which one which ones have the, the best fit as far as constructs, um, because there was a lot of, of overlap between the constructs. We think this is due uh, to the similarity of the theoretical underpinnings that broadly inform DNI research. So most of these um, are informed by things like organizational theory, diffusion of innovations, and political science theory. There's actually a review uh, that found for the 33 frameworks they looked at, they found three theories underlying them, persuasive communication, diffusion of innovation, and social marketing. So that's part of why there's going to be really similar constructs across the different the different models. We have a couple of other uh, useful resources in the paper. Um, the first looks at whether or not to use an existing model or develop a new model. Uh, we did identify uh, 61 models, and again, our search was not exhaustive, so, um, and this was uh, almost three years ago now, so um, there are going to be um, probably even more at this point. Um, and there's also considerable, consider, considerable overlap between those. So in, if you're considering developing a new model, it, it would definitely be worthwhile to identify a clear gap in the literature before starting um, that process. The process of using an existing model can be particularly helpful to the literature. It can um, give some uh, empirical evidence to the model and its constructs and also increase the generalizability of the model. Uh, so that's worth considering when, when making that choice. Um, most of the information about uh, selecting a model that's in the paper is, is what I've gone through, but um, we did sort of devise the paper as a way to guide people through uh, selecting those models. Um, we have a few resources on using the selected model, and I've actually got um, the next slide I have has um, some links to those resources. Um, we have a little bit of discussion about adapting a model. Um, since there are so many models, and, and we do um, think that using existing models might be a particularly good approach, uh, there probably will be some adaptation required um, when using a model that already exists. And so these are going to be adaptations that will improve the appropriateness of a model uh, for you, the intervention that you're looking at disseminating or implementing, the population that you're working in, and also the setting and context that the study is going to be in. And so these um, are definitely things that can happen in using a model, um, but it's really important that these be documented and monitored so that they can uh, be studied and also be incorporated into the literature on that model. So if someone else is looking to use it, um, they can understand how it's been uh, adapted in the past. Another really important issue um, is measurement. Measurement is one of the main ways that a model is operationalized into a study, and so it's particularly important here. Um, unfortunately, the field is pretty limited when it comes to measurement. I do have a slide with some resources on measurement um, that I'll um, provide as well. Um, because that's going to be particularly important in how you apply a model in your study. Um, the paper also has some case studies. Uh, these are looking at ways that the model has been applied either retrospectively to inform an intervention or prospectively to inform a study design. Um, we wanted these case studies to um, come from a diversity of fields. So there's, there's case studies from, from fields from obesity, policy to substance um, use treatment. Um, we provide some information. We give uh, background on the model. We talk about how the model was applied in that research setting. And for a few of them um, where measurement was discussed, we um, give some information on construct measurement. And so here, as I mentioned, are some of the resources on using a model. Uh, they give more detailed gu guidance, um, some also on selecting a model, but also how to apply that model in your study. 
Um, three of them are websites with links. Um, they have they have a lot of different categories within those websites um, that can direct you to the resources that might be most helpful. Um, the third bullet is actually a training institute where researchers can come and learn more about how to conduct um, DNI research. As I mentioned, measurement is particularly important. Um, there was actually a recent paper in Implementation Science Bill um, looking at or sort of discussing the issues in, implement, in measurement, uh, the lack of measurement tools available, the, what, what factors are considered in, in instrumentation development, um, issues around reliability and validity of, of instruments. And so this is um, something that would be really important to consider in applying your model is how you're going to measure the constructs for the model that you select. And so these are a couple of resources of places where you can find measures and find information on measurements. Um, the Seattle Implementation Research Conference Measures Project um, provides a comprehensive library of DNI instruments. And it's got a few other extra features. Um, it's organized those around a couple of um, uh, other models in DNI, and so it can be really helpful in searching for constructs that way. Um, it also offers a rating system for the instruments, and so you can find a little bit more information about the validity of the instruments as you're looking for them. Um, the Grid Enabled Measures database, which was developed by NCI, also has um, measures organized by construct. So it's got uh, behavioral, behavioral and social science measures, and you can actually click through the different constructs that you might be interested in from the model that you've selected uh, to find measures that might be available to assess those. Um, here at WashU, the Dissemination, Dissemination Implementation Research Core at the Center for Mental Health Services Research has a measures, a measures collection, and that offers a list of measures um, that you can search through and find if there's any that um, address the constructs that you're interested in and then to find um, that measure. Another really great resource is the um, Consolidated Framework for Research Implementation, for implementation Research um, has a website that's really useful. Um, it's useful in describing the, the framework itself, but it also has um, links to measures that have been used, links to um, papers where the framework has been used to inform the study. It also has a tool for helping uh, build an interview guide. Um, so things like that that can help you uh, understand how to operationalize your study, uh, your model into um, the context of your study. So just a few um, things we're looking at going forward. Um, one of the main things we wanted to do with this paper, and I think this webinar helps to do that, is facilitate model collection and use by DNI researchers and also by um, scientists who are interested in dissemination and implementation but are not as well versed in DNI research specifically. Um, and so we wanted to get that out um, to people who might be able to, to use these to select models for their work. Um, we also think that there are a number of models that were excluded um, because they targeted uh, practitioner uh, and clinician implementation efforts. Uh, these could also be inventoried and synthesized and organized in some way that might help uh, practitioners identify models that are going to be most helpful in their work. There have been studies, uh, have been reviews that have attempted to do this. Usually they're um, specific to a field of interest like nursing, um, and that can help practitioners in those fields find the models that are going to help their work. Um, there's a couple of limitations to DNI research that we think um, could be helpful as the field moves forward in helping people use these models uh, most effectively in their studies. Um, again, measurement is going to be a big issue, um, and me measures to address study, study constructs um, are going to, as those evolve, will help as people use these models in their work. Um, we also did this review as a narrative review. Um, we couldn't uh, do much of a systematic search because there is real inconsistency in the terminology used to discuss dissemination implementation research. Um, in fact, if you're listening from Canada, dissemination implementation research uh, is called knowledge translation. So just the, the variety of language that's used um, makes systematic searching a little bit more difficult. Um, there is a glossary available to sort of clarify uh, the discussion and, and to encourage consistent use of the DNI language so that we can uh, facilitate searches both for models in general but also for specific constructs within those models. So overall, as you can see from uh, especially the appendix table, there's a lot of different fields that inform this work, and they're really, uh, this really is a transdisciplinary effort, um, and researchers can really benefit by working across fields to use uh, the models from different fields and also to uh, use the experience of other researchers um, from different fields as, as they go forward and, and inform their, their work. 
Um, before I turn it over, I just want to thank um, the other authors of the paper um, who were really helpful and informative in, in moving that work forward, as well as um, the group here that we have at WashU Wonder that has helped us um, immensely in um, in moving this forward, and also our funders um, as well. And so I think with that, I can turn it over uh, to the next discussion. Great. Um, thank you, uh, Dr. Tabak, for a very informative uh, presentation and for your team's uh, efforts to consolidate um, the most relevant uh, DNI models. I'd like to thank Dr. Chambers and the NCI's Implementation Science Team uh, for this opportunity to present some of our work, which attempts to uh, expand at least one aspect of uh, the 2012 review using citation analysis. Uh, using this approach, we found that uh, this manuscript is increasingly cited and that perhaps citation rates uh, might also be something to consider when selecting uh, DNI models. Uh, my own interest in implementation research stems from a health services research background and uh, my clinical efforts uh, to improve prostate cancer care across the primary specialty care interface um, as a urologist. And so uh, as part of background, I think uh, most would agree that uh, DNI research uh, and practice was uh, recently informed uh, by the review which uh, you uh, uh, just went over. And I think while the, uh, this is a rich resource uh, that is advancing the field, there was limited information on the actual use of the, these frameworks. Um, and so further understanding the knowledge utilization surrounding uh, these DNI models may help expand upon uh, the robust uh, groundwork uh, that you put forth in, in several ways. Uh, First, to help identify those most impactful models that can potentially help you uh, select among them. Uh, second, to delineate uh, the professional network and current landscape of DNI in this uh, kind of rapidly evolving uh, field. And third, uh, to provide direction, uh, as you had um, uh, alluded to, for future DNI efforts surrounding how we conceptualize and operationalize models and, and uh, as for measurement as well. And so uh, bibliometric analysis is one way uh, to understand how these models are used uh, in the literature. Um, they're increasingly applied uh, as a method uh, to uh, quantify the impact of academic research as shown in this figure with uh, years across the x-axis and number of PubMed manuscripts that um, are uh, linked to bibliometric analysis. You see that this is an increasingly used tool um, it can examine relationships between authors, institutions, and, and countries uh, using tools such as uh, citation analysis. Again, uh, particularly relevant to this uh, rapidly evolving uh, field of DNI. And so um, our study had uh, two aims. Um, first, we wanted to map the knowledge utilization of the source uh, review manuscript uh, to understand the degree to which it's being cited in the, in the literature and potentially guiding uh, DNI model selection. And second, to identify those leading uh, models across the dissemination to implementation spectrum that you had outlined using citation analysis as potentially something to consider um, when uh, selecting a model. And so uh, for the methods, um, the source manuscript was your 2012 Bridging Research and Practice Models for Dissemination and Implementation uh, Research um, Manuscript, uh, where you outlined uh, 61 models. The, the primary reference uh, for 50 of those models uh, was a peer-reviewed uh, published article, and 11 uh, of the models were um, their primary reference was a document, such as a report, a chapter, or a book. Uh, we gleaned our citation data from the Web of Science uh, for the peer-reviewed literature and Google Scholar for the others. And the primary outcome for the study was the average uh, citations per year. And so we found that the source manuscript uh, was increasingly cited over the past several years uh, with over 80 citing articles. Uh, this indicates its value um, as a recognized resource for DNI researchers and practitioners. Uh, based on these findings, there's no reason to suspect that this trend 
um, of increased citation is going to decline at least in the near future. Um, this is a next slide is a citation map. Uh, it's a geographical representation that essentially shows um, citation relationships between uh, the paper and its citing uh, manuscripts, in this case, the institution involved. And so at the um, top of the figure, you can see Washington University where um, uh, the source document originated. And we also see that most citations uh, of the document are based in U.S. institutions, um, followed by a few from Canada and other countries. And so this is just another means to understand and visualize the knowledge utilization um, for this review and its growing professional network of users um, that will continue to be an important uh, uh, contribution to, to the literature. So with respect to our model citation outcomes um, for average citations per year in the peer-reviewed um, uh, primary references, it ranged from less than one to over 100 with uh, Dr. Greenhall's um, diffusion of innovations and service organizations leading the way. Uh, for the other documents, it ranged from zero to over 1,000. Not surprisingly, with uh, the diffusion of innovations as the uh, most cited uh, model uh, in the study. When we looked at first author country of origin for the DNI models, we see that the United States accounted for 61%, followed by Canada, UK, Australia, and the Netherlands and Iran. And so kind of giving an overview of the uh, global um, connections for uh, DNI research. Shown here are 20 of the 50 leading peer-reviewed um, models uh, based on the Web of Science citation tool. Um, you may recognize many of these models. And I think we can glean at least two things uh, from this table. Uh, first, is that it confirms that DNI research is based on a recent explosion of models, frameworks, and theories, and the fact that most of those um, developed and, and published in the past one to two decades. Uh, second, uh, it appears that citations per year may be something to consider when choosing a model, in addition to the socio-ecological framework uh, level, the construct flexibility, and location on the dissemination to implementation spectrum uh, that uh, Dr. Tavik uh, had covered earlier uh, today. Again, uh, here are the leading document-based DNI models using Google Scholar. Clearly, there are some standouts, and it's difficult to know, actually, whether the more recent models will be increasingly used or not uh, based on this analysis. Uh, these documents can be more difficult to retrieve than the peer-reviewed uh, counterparts in some cases and uh, that may limit their exposure or uptake. Yet another way to organize the models is with respect to the di dissemination to implementation spectrum and uh, the citation analyses. Um, as you can see, it does help rank uh, the models in terms of those with the most citations and potentially use. Um, this could help inform the choices we make when choosing models for interventions. Again, uh, this work would not be possible, or at least would be made very difficult without the groundwork uh, that Dr. Tabak's team and the review article uh, had, had put forth. So with, uh, in conclusion, uh, we found that the source article is an increasingly recognized resource for uh, DNI researchers and practitioners that can serve as a substrate for further research building upon the foundation and potentially promoting systematic advances in the field. Uh, I think moving forward, this reference will likely have increasing influence and implications uh, for DNI. Um, we identified the impactful models influencing DNI using uh, citation analysis. And it's interesting and potentially helpful to know the citation rates. Uh, however, there are limitations with respect to this approach, um, one of which is the expanding repertoire of index journals. Um, and there's a greater need to better understand what citing a model actually entails, uh, necessitating further research efforts uh, to examine how models are actually used in the literature and in practice, and as well as to identify criteria for selecting a framework or model uh, for our intervention development. Uh, with respect to the former, 
for example, what does citing or using a model actually mean? Um, this is a recent study that uh, examined the use of the knowledge to action framework using citation analysis and systematic review to see if the framework was used in practice and how. Uh, the authors found it was used with varying degrees of completeness from a simple reference to integration into the design, delivery, and evaluation of the implementation activity. So further investigating this aspect of model use uh, based on the foundation um, set forth and described earlier may yield even more to consider when uh, selecting and um, operationalizing and, and, and um, conceptualizing uh, our models. Um, with that, I'd like to say thank you for an opportunity to present here. I'd like to uh, acknowledge the Career Development Award, uh, my primary mentor, Dr. Ann Sales, well, the NCI mentor training for dissemination and implementation research in cancer, the empty dirt program. And I think we'll move on to the questions at this point. Thank you so much, Ted, and a big thank you to Rachel as well. Um, we'll open up for questions in just one moment. I just wanted to provide a reminder to everyone that there are two ways you can submit your questions. You can press star one and your cast your question live on the phone or you can use the Q&A feature at the top of your screen for those of you on the live meeting portal. Just type your question and hit ask. Okay, so uh, we uh, just like that already have uh, a question. Uh, and, and first of all, uh, thanks again to, uh, to Rachel and Ted uh, for great presentations. Um, so this is from uh, Lisa who says, I'm at Kaiser, uh, Lisa Harrington from uh, Kaiser. I'm at Kaiser, Northern California, uh, much better weather. I work to change physician behavior. As a new implementation researcher, I'm finding it challenging to get ahead of the work, but I'm only one of many individuals at the table. If I were to say, let's try this model, the rest might roll their eyes. How do you handle this? The idea of thinking about brainstorming models with potentially a team, and I know, uh, Rachel, you had mentioned just this notion that it's transdisciplinary, but also partnered research. Any thoughts from either of you on that one? Um, sure. I think uh, one of the things that models can be really useful for in doing that kind of work is providing just a, a way to think about what your study is doing and, and the different at, at all the different phases of your study. And so if you can sort of um, show a little bit the benefit of using a model in general, and then also once you've picked one that might fit particularly well, showing your colleagues how uh, using that model can make the study work better um, might be a way to sort of um, bring people around uh, to the idea of using a model that it can provide some structure and, and actually make the process easier um, might, might be a way to, to help make that work. Great, thanks. Um, uh, Ted, I, I have a comment uh, about that uh, question, if I can. Um, I've, um, as it, like in clinical practice, I've tried to, for example, I tried to use, uh, take the consolidated framework for implementation research where we, we were trying to introduce a new um, uh, kind of uh, procedure into our clinic, and I tried to take the different constructs and um, do some homework as to how um, how we actually are uh, addressing kind of attitudes and toward the intervention and the different um, constructs within the, the CIFR um, to actually it, 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 to what to Rachel's point to provide a framework uh, within which to you know operationalize this new procedure and I think once you actually put names and actual things that the people care about to those constructs and kind of explain to them how, the, you know, how their context fits into that framework potentially, um, that, that I found that to be very helpful. Great. Thank you. Okay. Um, another question uh, coming in. Uh, how would you advise someone uh, who is trying to contemplate, do I uh, develop my own new framework versus should I use one of those that's already been used before? Uh, so I think given the, the number that's out there, um, it's going to be pretty likely that there will be one that will fit. Um, I would say if you're thinking that you 
uh, really need need a framework, I would I would suggest taking a very careful look at the literature and just making sure that there's not some other model out there that can be useful. Um, undertaking that process of making a new framework on your own um, is going to be a lot, um, and probably um, if you really wanted to do it well, might delay your study. And so, if there's a way to use one, I would recommend doing that. Um, I would say that that looking for a clear identification that one is necessary would also uh, be a good indication. Um, I think just because there's so many out there and actually so little empirical evidence for some of them, that it would be a, a really great contribution to the field to actually use some of these um, and, and see how they can apply um, in the field. I think that would be that would be where I would suggest on that. Ted, any thoughts? No, I agree. I think um, actually using what's out there and um, highlighting the strengths and weaknesses of, uh, of uh, each model uh, or theory or framework within uh, real-world uh, implementation or DNI research um, would be uh, uh, a great contribution. Uh -huh. Great. And I, th I think just to add to that, the idea that uh, the model doesn't necessarily have to be used exactly as it is um, in its original publication. And so take, taking the idea that you could adapt some of the models that exist and even adapt, adapt them substantially as long as that's all being documented and studied. And so I think that might be a, a greater contribution than development of a new a new framework. Great. Thanks for those thoughts. Um, another one here. Um, beyond the specific criteria that were chosen to categorize the different models, are there other fields or sets of criteria that you think uh, could or, or should be used to, to further help uh, someone who's in the uh, position of choosing a particular model? I think it would be helpful to be able to see a little bit more about where and how they've been used. So we did have some examples, but to more systematically look at use of the models, um, I think that would probably be helpful in choosing because you could then um, maybe see an example or see some empirical evidence for the, the model working in the world. Um, that would probably be the biggest, I think, criteria that could be added um, to this. I'll try to think of if there's anything else I can think of. Uh -huh. Ted, any ideas from, from, from your work of, of other uh, sort of searchable criteria that would be useful uh, for that decision process? Um, other, other than um, I think the, the, the amount of citations that something has may um, be something to consider with respect to you know, uh, references as to how it's been used in other in, in other places that you could go to um, in terms of any broad um, topics uh, outside of what um, Rachel's work has done. I, I don't have any um, thoughts at this time. Uh -huh. I had another um, thought. I keep doing that. Um, but I was thinking that if you could – um, have a way to categorize what measurements were available for different frameworks. I think that would be really helpful in choosing. And so when you go and you sort of narrow down your list, you can, might compare uh, what measures are available for the construct, constructs and the different uh, choices. And that might be a way also to help um, categorize kind of within that. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. And excuse me, this is the operator. We do have a couple of questions from our end. Uh, terrific. Our first question comes from, I believe it was Boise Caribbean. Your line is open. And greetings, everyone. This is Boise Caribbean from University of Colorado. We used to be at Kaiser Permanente. Uh, I just wanted to have two comments. The first one is to share that we are actually launching a website today that is building on Rachel's work very heavily, and it's an interactive version of her work expanded with some work that was done by Sandy Mitchell at NCI. And it's an interactive uh, ability to search models using the different criteria that Rachel and her group developed and also to link those to the GEM, yeah. at this point, to the GEM measures. So hopefully this will just help a little bit more interactively search that set of currently 84 models that we included, and then the linkage between the measures and the constructs will be possible. Uh, the other piece that I wanted to uh, ask, actually, the question is, um, and I think it's one of the challenges of comparing models, that the terminology is so different across the constructs in these models. 
and uh, these models might uh, the constructs might mean actually the same thing. So, you know, what could do? Uh, what could the field do to some ways, in some ways, um, create a more comprehensive linkage between the different models in terms of the constructs? And how could we create this uh, linkage in a way that uh, everyone from the field will contribute? Uh, thanks for calling in. I was actually thinking about putting um, the website in the talk, but then I was I wasn't sure how far along it is. So that's great to hear that it's going to be available. Um, I think actually, as far as a way to sort of harmonize those different terminologies um, across the models, I know that was an issue in actually developing that website. Is, is different concepts that have maybe the same or very similar meanings but different names and. I don't know if it becomes almost like an electronic glossary or something like that because uh, I think it, it's hard for the models that exist um, to change the names um, of those constructs because they're sort of like written already. Um, but I don't know if there's maybe some sort of electronic um, way that you can link and almost like word map out um, constructs that might be similar or more different from each other where you could see these two overlap a lot. Um, and in fact, this model may include the exact same construct as another, just with different names. I don't know if something like that would be helpful. Okay, and um, there was a, a question that came in uh, for you, Borsiga, if you're still able to speak. If you could just, oh, you're not, oh. So so we'll follow up with the URL of, of the website that, uh, that Borsica had mentioned. In fact, uh, we, can, we can make sure that it's posted on the follow-up discussion on R2R. Um, and I think there was another question. Yes, our next question comes from Lisa. Your line is open. I'm sorry, I don't have any questions. Thank you. Okay, um, great. Um, so I uh, was just curious uh, to, to ask each of you, as, you, have you, as you've contemplated your own research studies, uh, just thinking about how you've gone about selecting a particular framework. Yeah, we were actually talking about this a little bit before we started. Um, I actually did kind of like go to the table, um, table two and, and sort of, or table three, I'm sorry, and sort of look, um, you know, in in the um, sort of, I was focused a little bit more on an implementation type of question, and then I wanted something, since I'm pretty new to this, that was going to be a little more prescriptive and sort of tell me step by step how to, how to think about um, putting the model into my study, and so that was that was my approach. And then I looked um, within those. I got you know the papers for each of the different ones and kind of compared them and looked for one that um, I was looking at something that actually in all of the reviewing these I hadn't seen a whole lot that uh, were in the setting that I was interested in. And so I tried to look for one that would have constructs that seemed like they would translate really well um, to the setting that that I was looking to study. So that was kind of my my approach. Um, for for my uh, study, I've uh, decided to go with the Consolidated Framework for Implementation and Research just because um, after reviewing the different ones and being here in Ann Arbor, um, there's a lot of expertise using this. There's it's map, The constructs are mapped to uh, questions that you can actually assess uh, the setting and, um, you know, the different intervention characteristics or inner or outer setting aspects of things you want to learn about uh, prior to, while you're doing your intervention planning. Um, that's kind of the organizational level um, uh, framework and um, coupling that with um, a more individual level uh, behavior change framework or uh, the, using the theoretical domains framework, again, uh, the ability to um, operationalize uh, both of those to assess the context, um, develop the uh, intervention, and then hopefully um, on the after the intervention to again assess and learn how the um, how the intervention actually worked and through what constructs uh, were changed using uh, the survey. So that's how I'm uh, going about that uh, in you know with, with uh, my mentorship team. Okay, great. Um, so, so thank you both, and, and we're very uh, 
excited both uh, to have had your presentations, but also hopefully to simulate more discussion about how those of you on the phone and others have been using different models and, and really get a better sense of uh, what kinds of tools, in addition to those that have been discussed today, would be more useful for uh, for folks uh, planning uh, the use of, of different models. I'm going to turn things over to Sarah and just wanted to say th thank you all for participating. Uh, so, Sarah, take it away. And with that, I just wanted to make note that your feedback is important to us, and we encourage you to complete our online evaluation, a link to which will be sent to you in an email shortly. As mentioned, we'd like to continue this discussion from the webinar online at researchtoreality.cancer.gov, where you can engage with the speakers and other participants through discussion forums and posts. Thank you again for joining us for this month's webinar, and we hope to see you in February.